Lord God, we are thankful that we can gather in this format, that, w- that we can uh, be with each other on these mornings around your word. And so today, again, we ask your spirits' um, insight, guidance, direction as we look at this passage of uh, Luke's gospel. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this morning I want to do, um, I think I want to read the whole text first, and then I want to argue the case that these are tied together. Uh, even though they seem disparate uh, parts of Luke, and I want, I think they're uh, all important for us to um, to grab a hold of, and so I want to uh, see if we can uh, come to some conclusion on how they fit together. So let me begin with Luke chapter eleven, at verse twenty-seven, and it happened. When he was, uh, or as he was saying these things, um, a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice, uh, and she said to him, Blessed the womb, the one carrying you, and uh, the breasts uh, from which you um, gain strength. Um, And he said, rather, blessed the one who is hearing the word of God and guarding it. Um, Now, uh, as the crowd was increasing, he began to speak. This generation is an evil generation. It is seeking a sign, and a sign will not be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as it happened, uh, Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. Thus, um, also, the Son of Man will be a sign to this generation. The Queen of the South Uh, she raised up, or she will be raised up in judgment against or after, I think against is probably better, against uh, the men. And interestingly here, it's not anthropos, it's aner, it's uh, men for some reason. Uh, The men of uh, this generation, and she will judge them. Because... Uh, She came from the outer regions of the earth to listen uh, to the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, greater than Solomon is here. Uh, Men of Nineveh will be raised up in the judgment against this generation, and they will condemn it because um, they repented uh, at the preaching of Jonah And behold, greater than Jonah is here. No one, uh, after kindling a a, a lamp, um, places it in a hidden place, uh, nor under a, a grain basket but upon a lampstand, in order that those entering, uh, they might see uh, the light. The light of the body is your eye. Whenever your eye is healthy, uh, also the whole body, your whole body, is filled with light. Um, And um or or uh if it is whenever it is uh, evil it might be evil also your body is filled with darkness um therefore watch carefully uh so that the light in you uh is uh is not darkness therefore if 
your whole body is light, there's filled with light, uh, not having a part, any part of darkness, um, it will be, the whole will be um, uh, as whenever the light shines its, its rays uh, on you. Okay, so uh, when it's filled with light, the light rays uh, will shine on you. Okay. Um, so what I want to say about this is it's critically important uh, for our understanding of a text like this uh, in relationship to the Word of God, in relationship to how we respond. And here I would say, let me just give you a summary. What I would say by way of summary is that the first section, uh, 26 and 27, or 27 and 28, have to do with hearing and guarding the Word of God. The next section uh, about uh, with the Ninevites, with Jonah and uh, the Queen of the South of Sheba, um, has to do with responding to the Word, is sp specifically in terms of repentance. And the third section, uh, about the lamp, uh, your your eye is uh, the lamp of the body and so forth, has to do with the, the inner transformation that will come out um, as you live your life because of uh, a healthy eye. Okay. Uh, and that transformation is really based on an understanding of the text, the, uh, the preaching of Jonah or the preaching of Jesus, which is greater than Jonah. Uh, or greater than the wisdom of Solomon, and it is a reflection of the importance of the Word of God. So I want to tie those these three thoughts together. So if we look at the first uh, couple, or the first two verses, uh, it it sounds like when Jesus says, "Oh, don't don't uh, honor bless uh, Mary's womb." Uh, there's something greater than that that you should bless. Uh, now, he's not, I don't think Jesus uh, or Lucas is intending for this to be uh, a put down of Mary. It's not, a, it's not disparaging Mary. Rather, Jesus here, I believe, is subverting the status of Mary based on ancestry or based specifically on her children. That, that was that was the way a woman at the time really received status. What the accomplishments of her of her children, especially her sons, in this point, uh, in that patriarchal society. And so, um, what Jesus is saying is, no, don't bless Mary. Mary isn't blessed because of her progeny, because of the children that she's had, specifically, you know, himself. Uh, she's blessed because. Uh, she has guarded, she has heard and guarded the word of God. In that sense, she's carried the word of God. Now, if you go back to the, uh, what we call the Magnificat uh, in Luke chapter one, Mary's song, you see there that the whole thing is really quotes from scripture. She knows her Bible. Uh, she knows what uh, this one strand especially of what God is doing to raise up the humble, to raise up the poor, uh, to bring down the mighty of the world. Uh, there's a grand reversal, and she gets it. She understands it. And what Jesus is now saying to the woman who's in the crowd who spoke out, he is saying, no, listen, the reason Mary is blessed is because she um, she heard the word, she carried it in her heart, and she uh, guarded it. She, she, in that sense, uh, she committed herself to it. Uh, she believed it, and she, and she uh, committed herself to it. So I think that's what's going on in this first section. Um, it's, it's elevating the Word of God to the place of prominence in a person's life. What's going to guide you? What's going to lead you? What, how are you going to understand life um, and what God is doing in life? And the way you're going to do that is through the Word of God. And I think Jesus here has in mind the Word of God as a Hebrew Bible, right? Um, although it hadn't been 
finalized in terms of uh, canonical writings, uh, it was still, there were still the Pentateuch and the law and so forth. Um, but I think Luke has in mind Jesus' words as well. So I think we have that put together in this particular text. Secondly, in, in the section on, um, which comes from verse 29 to 32, we see here that what the um, Queen of Sheba, the Queen of the South, uh, did was came and listened to Solomon's wisdom and uh, concurred that Solomon had wisdom beyond anybody she had ever heard. But the point that Luke is making, that Jesus is making, and Luke is recording here, is that there is someone greater than Solomon who is here. Are you listening to him? The same is true with the Ninevites. Um, they listened to Jonah. Jonah was the sign. Now, one wonders what that means, because was it his preaching that was the sign to them? Was it that he had been in the big fish for three days um, and God had spared his life? Was that the sign? So it was kind of a, a resurrection um, experience. What was exactly the sign that that Jonah is? And it doesn't tell us. Um, it's just that Jonah was a sign. And, and in Jonah's preaching, and I think it bends towards the preaching because we're really focused here on the word. It bends towards the preaching, but it it's, I think, a combination of all. But Jonah himself was then the sign, and his preaching was the sign to the Ninevites. Now, the, the critical thing is what they did with that. Uh, Jesus said, this generation that he's in isn't going to get another sign. By the way, was the exorcism not enough of a sign? But they're not going to get a sign. They're not going to get a sign that authenticates what Jesus has already done. He himself is authenticating the word of God uh, and the work of God. And you see that in the exorcisms. And then you'll see that in the resurrection uh, later. And you'll see it in his preaching. So Jesus then becomes a sign like Jonah was a sign. The, the issue was that the Ninevites, these Gentiles, like the Queen of Sheba, a Gentile, responded to the preaching uh, of Jonah with repentance. Uh, the whole country did. Uh, the men, the women, the cattle, everybody did. And uh, they responded one of the things that tells us, I think, is that God's mercy, God's grace, God's salvation goes wider than uh, we often expect it to go. Uh, here you have the example of Gentiles to whom the salvation of God has come. And they, they've heard the word and they've repented. Um, and Jesus is saying that now to is he saying that to Jewish people? Is he saying it to a mixed audience uh, on this travel that he is doing from Galilee to Judea? It doesn't tell us that. But um, nonetheless, he's, uh, I think in Matthew's gospel, he's now referring, he, he's responding to Pharisees. So they're Jews in, in this context. But the wideness of God's mercy, the wideness of God's salvation. And then we have this really interesting, and I've never um, totally understood it and still don't totally understand it, but this idea that the, the lamp of the body is the eye. Um, and it, so if your eye is healthy, if your eye is good and clean and healthy, then uh, your whole body will be healthy. Now, what I've learned in studying this recently is that we need to adopt, in order to understand this text, we need to adopt an ancient physiology. The eye, and Joel Green was really helpful. Some of you know Joel Green. He was helpful in, in um, this particular uh, text. The eyes uh, do not function by allowing light to come in. In other words, that's not their primary function in this physiology. Rather, um, the eye functions by allowing the body's own light to go out. Okay, so you have just a reversal of what we might think. So the eyes 
are a source of light insofar as they allow the body's light to go forth. So what does this mean then? If you have a healthy eye, what's going to come out from your inner being is generosity, is sincerity, is mercy, is grace. That's going to come out and illuminate those around you. If you have an evil eye or a sick eye, it's an indication that there is uh, darkness inside of you, darkness here metaphorically, but uh, a darkness inside of you that is selfishness, it's covetousness, it's rebellion, um, it's sinfulness. And that's going to come out and that's going to spread uh, among the people. And so the point here is that uh, your eye becomes that um, light uh, on the lampstand now that is shining forth what is inside of you. So if we put these then together, if we put these three texts together, the first is really um, a challenge to hear and guard the word of God. Uh, the second section is a challenge to respond to the word of God, to the preaching of Jonah, to the preaching of Jesus, uh, to the wisdom of Solomon, respond to that uh, with repentance. And the third is then the transformation that takes place inside of you when you um, hear and guard the word, and when you then um, uh, do that by repentance, there is, a, there is an inner change, a transformation in you. And that transformation then spreads its light uh, as it comes through the eye, it spreads its light on those around you as an indication um, of generosity, of mercy, of uh, compassion, and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I uh, in your in your um, outline, I I put down three questions. Uh, but before we get to the questions, I'm going to just stop talking there and see if anybody has anything they want to contribute. So let's see. We do have one thing in the chat, and I'll just mention that I'm going to post something in the chat for any of the for anyone uh, about a class Michael Barron will be teaching on Sunday. So I'll give you the information there. But Marie says in verse 28, I agree that Jesus is not subverting motherhood. His better comparison is that uh, hearing the word of God is gestational and the doing is the nutrition we need. Okay, good. Yeah, no, I don't think he's subverting motherhood. I don't think he's subverting. What I think he is subverting is um, the tradition that, that Mary then fell into in terms of her status is based on her children's, um, and specifically on Jesus' work. No, Jesus is saying, no, that's not that's not where her status is from. It's from her hearing and guarding, uh, gestating the word of God, yeah. Okay, let's see, we have a couple of hands. Uh, Claudia, go ahead. First of all, Tom, I have to say, your summary and insight keep respond and then transformation is mind blowing. I, you're just so good at this. And I'm so grateful for this one particular teaching. Okay. That being said, how often I've thought, and I've heard other people say, well, you know, if only we'd been around when Jesus walked, then we'd really get it. And this middle section, and we know his own people who lived with him for years, half the time, they were in a fog and didn't get it. And mm -hmm. it's something about faith and it's something about, um, I, I don't know, access that that even those who were in Nineveh, who walked with Jesus, there's more there that we have to depend on God to bring us along or we have to open ourselves to receive it. Anyway, that's it. That's all. Yes, I'm one of those who has often said, well, if I wish I had been there, because then I would, you know, it would be so um, easy to believe. I'm not sure. I, I, I would 
I think knowing myself a little bit better these days, I probably would be pretty much in the camp of the Pharisees. Um, hopefully not, but um, there's some legalistic tendencies in my life. <laughs> Let's see, Doug, go ahead. So, so verse 29, the, you know, this generation is an evil generation. It asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. It just seems like at what point in the history of God's relationship to mankind were there more signs <laughs> at the time of, it just seems like the number of signs that Jesus is creating. Like I, I just, it almost like, what are they because you know, earlier in the chapter where they ask for more signs, even though he's done all these things, it's like, what do they expect? Or Yes, uh, that's an odd thing, isn't it? Because he's doing signs all the time. And if you look at the fourth gospel, you see some of the major signs that he has done as well. Um, I, I think what they wanted... For instance, their prophets, their um, religious leaders, some of them were also doing signs. They were doing miracles. I think what they wanted was authentication that Jesus was not a false prophet. And, and this is the text that we looked at last time. Doing these things, these magical things um, in uh, the power of the devil. And so they were saying, okay, our, our guys do that as well. Um, but prove that, you're, that your signs are coming from God. Um, and I think they wanted authentication. That's, that's the only thing that makes any sense to me. They wanted to make sure, and in this sense, they doubted, uh, whether they whether Jesus' signs were really coming from that, but they they wanted authentication that this was really someone who uh, God endorsed. Right. I mean, it's it's just interesting, you know, as someone who has spent my life asking for signs, right? <laughs> like to look at the two points in the history of of God's relationship to us, which is mm -hmm. sort of like the Exodus and then the time of Jesus where there was just so many signs and yet it, it didn't seem to make a difference in terms of people's belief. Like it's, it's just sort of a, it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see others. Uh, do we have other questions, comments? Uh, Mary, go ahead. Well, I would just throw out a um, shout out to the, concept of obedience. One of my favorite books that I would highly recommend is Eugene Peterson's book. What is it? A Long Obedience in the Right Direction. Same direction, yeah. It, and, um, and I do think this is, I think, evergreen because it's great to have Bible studies and do things like we're doing right now. And isn't this uplifting and and talking about the philosophy and what we believe and what we don't believe. But at the end of the day, you, you gain um, understanding through obedience and actually, and obedience isn't easy. If you look back and we, we read the good Samaritan, you know, and, um, and then we read in the Our Father, one of the things that convicts me all the time is our daily bread and not putting too much store in our own wealth and our, our anxiety around having enough and having enough for our children. And the obedience around this is pretty uh, radical, I would say. And just practicing, you know, it, mm -hmm. there's a time when you stop talking about it and you just do it even more mm -hmm. yes and i would say we need the combo mm -hmm. um we come at a text differently every time we come at a text mm -hmm. 
we've had an experience we've in the market or in on the freeway or with our children or something has happened in our life that has made us pause and think maybe in new ways and we'll come to the same text in mm -hmm. a different way and see different things so i would say for me that's why the the image of mary um as a model not just because of the uh, accomplishments of her son or other children um but because of her embrace of the word of god uh hearing it guarding it um and the image then of it growing inside of her she's carrying this i i love that image as well mm -hmm. um becomes so important because she's she then shows that it's not just um well that that it is a combination of of uh hearing it and of coming back at it and maybe even letting it form more and more in her in her life and when she comes out with the magnificat uh with this mary song uh it is a radical, I want to say it's a radical political worldview. Mm -hmm. um, spiritual worldview, yes, but, a, but a, a radical political worldview as well, which is going to take down the strong and the mighty and lift up the needy and the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the Roman world, to say that uh, was quite countercultural. Mm -hmm. So she's so yes, thank God she carried the son of God, the living son of God and the living word of God. But she also understood something about the written word of God mm -hmm. that really helped her um, as well. So, yeah. Um, I think, let me just uh, put one foot in it. I think all of this is meant for our obedience. I think that's your point. Absolutely. Um, it's not just a nice academic exercise. It is meant to to transform the inner life so that so that the eye, if it is that lamp, when mm -hmm. when when that lamp shines, it's not going to be a, a sickness or an evil eye. It's going to be a healthy eye. Mm -hmm. And that's the obedience then that comes out from inside of us having. Mm -hmm lived with and let the word uh, live in us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we just have a couple of comments. One is from uh, someone named iPhone. I'm not sure who that is, but uh, I think that many people dreamed of freedom from Rome at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Don uh, says that our Bay Farm group gathered last night and shared blessings and prayers for each other. So that's nice. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else? Do we have other questions, comments, thoughts? I, <clears throat> excuse me, just in closing, I would say one of the interesting things that I um, have had to adjust to, we never get to complete obedience. Um, I thought, I, and I've said this to you before, but I thought by this time in my life, I wouldn't have to learn anymore. I mean, I know enough. I know, I mean, I've been, you know, thinking about this stuff and trying to put it into practice um, since the womb almost, um, give or take a few uh, blips <laughs> that I wasn't quite there. Um we, I still have to learn about this. And obedience is still an ever-present challenge. Uh, it's not something that we arrive at. And that's why I think centering ourselves around the word of God with one another in helping each other understand it and then live it is critically important. So Yeah. I, um, I okay. saw that Marker uh, popped in with a question. Did you want to uh, be our last question, Marker? Uh, not yes, <laughs> you know. To me, the amazing thing 
about the the reference to Jonah is, as I recall, I, I probably should have gone back and looked at it closer, but pardon the puppy, but um, it doesn't seem like the Ninevites asked for a sign. At least it's not recorded in the story that they ever asked for a sign. And I think it's remarkable that in the in the preaching of the word to the Ninevites, they were convicted and that they responded um, in with 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 such um, resounding uh, faith <laughs> that it kind of puts everybody else to shame, including including us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right, and that's part of the, I think the the wideness of God's mercy. Um, God cared about the Ninevites. We don't. We don't. God cared about the Gentiles. Um, and yes, and they, I think that is part of the point of the passage. They do put us to shame often. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think that's probably it. Okay, well, let me close us then with prayer. God, we are seeking to follow you in ways that may change the direction of our thinking or our uh, acting. And we ask that your spirit would give us the courage to so be that person, that new person, that person transformed, that person whose eye is a lamp of goodness and grace and mercy uh, toward those that uh, come our way and we cross paths with. So guide us in this living, uh, the excitement of it, the challenge of it, um, the comfort of it. Uh, guide us in all those ways uh, by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.